Hey everybody, I've got another book recommendation today, and this one's going to be a little bit off the beaten path, a little different than some of the ones I uh, usually talk about on this channel. Um, and uh, this is going to be in the genre of post-apocalyptic, uh, sort of quasi-sci-fi, um, and it's this book, Canticle for Leibowitz, or Leibowitz, uh, by Walter Miller Jr., and this is, uh, I hope you can get a good look at it. This is a book I actually read in seminary. It was not part of the curriculum, but it was, um, I think, a formative read in some ways. And I'll kind of uh, give you sort of a, a brief outline of the, um, of the plot. So this is maybe some light spoilers here, but uh, not too much that you couldn't discern from maybe the back of the uh, reading the back. So um, Canticle for Leibowitz takes place in the future, and it takes place after a horrific uh, nuclear war has happened. And in response to the nuclear war, human beings have decided that science, technology, technological advancement is just more danger and more trouble than it's worth, and they try to systematically purge society of technology. And so they, they burn all the books, as, as kind of what's going on in the cover here, and all the blueprints, and all of the... Um, all the technology is destroyed because they don't want to ever repeat uh, what has happened with this terrible nuclear war. And the nuclear war has devastated the earth. And so, like, the city of Rome no longer exists, um, and, and many other places no longer exist. They've been wiped off the map. And uh, what happens after technology is kind of purged is that humanity sort of reverts, I guess is the right way, to kind of a early medieval um, kind, of, kind of lifestyle. And there are um, sort of city-states and kings and, and there are monks and monasteries who are, just as did actually happen, uh, preserving the knowledge from a previous era. If you've read books like uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization or Sailing from Byzantium, they both chronicle how uh, monks and monasteries preserved the knowledge of the ancient Greeks and Romans during uh, the, the tumultuous period after the collapse of the Roman Empire. And, and through that crazy period, monks and monasteries preserved uh, for us the writings of Aristotle and Plato and Cicero and all these great ancient Greek and Roman thinkers. So something similar happens in A Canticle for Leibowitz. Uh, there are monks and monasteries, but they're preserving things like blueprints for machines and, and technological know-how. And they, they take things like blueprints and make them into gold-gilded icons and, and stuff like this. And uh, these monks are Roman Catholic, and as with uh, the period uh, after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, it's the church that is the most sort of robust institution with the deepest roots that can kind of stay and survive the tumult. And so the monasteries are still there, the monks are still there, and, um, and the Roman Catholic Church is still there. It's headquartered in, I think, um, somewhere in Houston, uh, maybe Corpus Christi, uh, Texas, somewhere like that. Uh, it's, it's headquartered in Texas. And one of the major uh, powerful nation states that's on the arise is, is Texarkana. Uh, the, the book takes place over a series of centuries, in, in um, maybe over a thousand years. And, and it, it's, I think in, it's been several years since I read it, as I said, but I think it's in three kind of big chunks where you like, look at what's going on and we fast forward a few hundred years and look again and then fast forward again. And so at first the monks are just struggling to survive. They're bandits, they're outlaws. It's a post-apocalyptic world. And they're trying to maintain and, and preserve this knowledge. And then you fast forward a few hundred years later and it's something similar to uh, what we call uh, the Renaissance is happening. And uh, people from outside of the monastery are coming in to, to like find this knowledge. And, and they discover that the monks have preserved all this stuff, all this scientific knowledge. And um, there's a great scene where this scholar uh, comes in and he's a little bit, you know, he doesn't trust clerics and monks and, you know, superstitious religious people, but he comes into this monastery, and they're so excited that the scholar has come. Uh, they prepare a little demonstration because one of the monks studying the ancient manuscripts has discovered how to generate electricity and, and uh, 
illumine a light bulb, right? Light up a light bulb. So the scholar walks into this darkened library and, and they flip the switch and this monk starts riding a bicycle basically and making electricity and the light lights up and this scholar is just overwhelmed. It's this bright light. It's not candlelight. It's nothing he's ever seen before. And the monks have this knowledge. And, and then you fast forward to uh, the end of the book and it's, it's like a 20th century uh, level of technology and the world is once again on the verge of nuclear annihilation. And so um, that's kind of the, the broad uh, sweep of the story. And um, it's really an interesting kind of meditation on several things. First of all, the nature of history. Is history just a cycle that repeats itself? That's what many of the ancient uh, Greeks and pagans believed. Or, as Christians and Jews believe, is history linear, even though there are patterns that repeat from one generation to another? You look at the Bible, and there's like the pattern of Exodus out of slavery that shows up again and again with the original Exodus, then with uh, the release from exile in Babylon, and then with the ministry of Jesus leading a spiritual Exodus. There are patterns that repeat, but history is moving toward a goal. It's not just a repetition. So one of the questions that the book asks is, what is the nature of history? And of course, a big part of that is, are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past? Do we learn from history? Is, I think, a question that the book is asking us to consider or maybe to try to do, right? Um, do we learn from our mistakes that we've made before or do we just repeat the patterns over and over again? Um, there's an interesting character, at least in the early parts of the book, and uh, he's this sort of Jewish guy living in the hills near the monastery. And he's like, they, they kind of, most of the monks think he's a kind of crazy guy, but the abbot or the guy in charge actually knows him and they, they get together and they talk from time to time. And he's, I, I, one of the things, if you read this book, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Who is this guy? I can't remember that it ever said. The Canticle for Leibowitz, um, one of the things that really strikes me about it, and I think this is an important word for our times today because we're not living through the collapse of, I hope, <laughs> uh, you know, a society on the same level of what happened when the Western Roman Empire collapsed and the kind of reseeding of, of knowledge. But, uh, but we are living through tumultuous times. And what are the kinds of communities that are robust enough to live through that tumult? And one of the things that's striking about the Canticle for Leibowitz, just like as really happened in Western history, is it's the monasteries. It's the intentional, highly disciplined religious communities that are able to weather that storm. They've got deep roots. They have traditions that are hundreds of years old that they have, are just maintaining. And um, it's interesting to me that there have been a number of high-profile converts to uh, more traditional forms of, of Christian faith in recent years. And um, I saw a video where um, Douglas Murray, um, who's himself, I think, agnostic now, uh, British uh, intellectual, in a, in a dialogue with N.T. Wright. If you go uh, Google on YouTube, or YouTube uh, N.T. Wright and Douglas Murray, you'll see this video. And Douglas Murray mentions that he's been surprised by some of his own friends, not a lot, but some kind of more secular kind of uh, intellectual types who in recent years have converted not just to Christianity, but to extremely traditional forms of Christianity, right? They don't just become Roman Catholic, they go to the Latin Mass, or they become Eastern Orthodox, or we've seen a lot of evangelicals on the Canterbury Trail becoming Anglican or, or Reformed people becoming Lutheran. There seems to be this kind of move toward more traditional forms of Christianity. And that's something I'm also kind of uh, been on that uh, journey, uh, particularly in college and seminary, and uh, rediscovering the traditions of uh, not only the early church, but even of, of the reformers as well, uh, that many Protestants don't know about. And, and, and having a, a, a practice and a religious community that's weathered storms for many centuries. It's not just some church that we just, you know, came up with, uh, you know, in the last generation to, to uh, kind of appeal to the current cultural moment, but something that really transcends the current cultural moment. Um, 
I, I wonder about that. Is that something that's going to be more attractive in this time of sort of upheaval in Western civilization that we seem to be living through right now um, with all the sort of protest movements um, calling into question some of the basic assumptions of Western civilization and uh, the, the loss of faith in many of our institutions, uh, not only religious but also secular and governmental and cultural. Um, are there communities of faith and, and disciplined ways of doing uh, the Christian life together that are um, going to be attractive to people precisely because they have weathered some of that. And that's something that uh, A Canticle for Leibowitz, I think, is a really great meditation on exactly that question as well. So this is a book. If you want to read something that's fiction, and uh, but nevertheless raises some really interesting questions, and um, it's... I don't even know if it's really from a faith perspective. It certainly demonstrates a great knowledge of um, especially uh, Roman Catholic monasteries. Um, so I would guess that the writer has spent some time there. But um, he's really just raising questions that I think anybody might enjoy uh, reading this book regardless of their faith um, and, and, and kind of stewing over these things, especially in light of kind of where we are now. One of the other questions that this book raises for me that kind of connects with where we are now is the, the, the wholesale rejection and, and the attempt to destroy uh, knowledge and scientific knowledge because of the chaos and the destruction and, and the death that science has brought to them. And, and I, I was thinking about that in light of the video you may have seen. Again, on YouTube, you can go watch this. A video of, of the comedians, Jon Stewart, talking to Stephen Colbert. And Jon Stewart uh, says uh, about this current pandemic, he's talking about the lab leak theory, which he thinks is legit. Uh, he says, um, I'm so very thankful for all the ways that science has helped uh, treat and alleviate the suffering of this disease that, John Stewart says, in all probability was caused by science and, and leaked from a lab, you know. And, and he, 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 uh, anyway, go watch the video. It's kind of funny and it has kind of a common sense, like, think about it uh, kind of angle that he's, he's advocating. So maybe... Uh, some of the, the ills with the pandemic are uh, kind of a, a whoops from a scientific laboratory, but even if that's not the case, uh, many of the big, serious sort of existential threats that we face, people talk about climate change, the alarmists even talk about climate catastrophe, uh, human activity releasing CO2 into the atmosphere, and that's what's causing the climate change. That's the result of technological innovation. That's the result of science and, and kind of uh, pushing the boundaries, as it were, of technology 100, 150 years ago. And now we're reaping that reward, perhaps. It's the result of science. Or uh, you think about kind of the big one. I watched a show a number of years ago about all the like doomsday threats that could wipe us out. And it went through, you know, an asteroid hits the earth or the super volcano under Yellowstone blows up or whatever. And it got to the end of the countdown. The number one most likely thing to wipe us out was a nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia. And um, we still have enough nuclear weapons brought to you by science uh, to wipe out the human race and, and irradiate the planet many times over again. And so I, I thought of that in light of uh, some of the new ways that kind of the boundaries are being pressed by science. And now people are talking about kind of, you know, editing human DNA and, and using technology to enhance the human creature to transcend our limitations and become, you know, humanity 2.0 with the assistance of science. And I'm one of the people who's like, maybe we should not do that, <laughs> right? Maybe we should put the brakes on that. Uh, maybe uh, give it a couple of hundred, three, four hundred years of thought before we do anything. Uh, because just because you can do something, just because the technology is there, uh, it may not be actually wise to do. And that, that was just, for me, as I was thinking about this book, another set of kind of interesting questions to chew upon, to wrestle with, to have little debates in my head about. So uh, it's another thing you might want to um, keep in mind as you, um, as you read this book. So Canticle for Leibowitz, excellent book. Uh, you can pick it up on any mainstream bookseller or I'm sure Barnes Noble or Books A Million can get it for you. And uh, it's definitely worth a read and it's an enjoyable read uh, in many ways, although it's heavy in some ways too. It's post-apocalyptic, right? Um, 
Anyway, I hope that is something that you will enjoy. And until we connect again, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. Amen.